Thank you everybody for being here. I know that I stand between you and lunch. I'm here presenting research on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Dan and Simpson. Uh, so let's get started. So as you all know, Java uses automatic memory management. Automatic memory management means that the developers no longer have control over uh, the memory that they're, they're allocating or deallocating. A lot of this happens behind the scenes uh, using the garbage plug. In the case of Java, it uses a generational garbage collector, but other managed runtimes use different types of garbage collectors. So uh, what this really means is data cannot be explicitly destroyed. So that means if we have some, uh, some type of uh, application that we want to protect sensitive data with, or, from, or protect sensitive data, uh, we can't do it. Uh, but that works out pretty good for us. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the other problem is when we're using generational garbage collection, we're creating multiple copies as we move data from one generation to the next generation. So our motivation behind this research is, uh, has several uh, problems to it. First of all, we've noticed that malware authors are starting to look at managed runtimes as a mechanism for writing their malware and deploying it to multiple systems. The reason for this is because the managed runtime gives the developer the ability to write at one time and deploy it to multiple platforms like Mac, Linux, or even Windows. The other problem is a lot of these uh, internet applications that we see today, uh, such as Apache Struts, Struts, are written in managed runtimes like Java. This gives the attacker the advantage if they understand how to write Java applications because they can live off the land and uh, exploit the fact that the runtime is something that they can uh, manage and manipulate. <coughs> And the other thing that we really want to, to, to take part in, based off of our previous research, is uh, these managed runtimes contain a number of different artifacts. So uh, processes, threads, passwords, um, sites that were visited, uh, commands that were run. And so that's, that's really the heart of what our research focuses on. So from this, we have several uh, research questions that we, we pose. First of all, can we exploit this metadata inside the garbage collected memory to uh, increase, the build, or increase the efficiency of our investigations, especially when we start investigating uh, server-side type of applications. Next, can we create a uh, viable timeline based off of the garbage collection's allocation strategy? And then finally, what kind of information can we obtain from, this, uh, from these uh, artifacts, and can it help us uh, make better decisions and more actionable uh, take more actual uh, approaches to the way we, we do our response. And then finally, uh, this is something that we explore to lead for future work. Can this approach or these methodologies be applied to runtimes like JavaScript or .NET? So the rest of the, the presentation is laid out in the following manner. I'm going to give an overview of uh, managed runtimes, uh, basically the garbage collection process or generational garbage collection. Talk a lot about or talk a little bit about our approach give the evaluation of our approach, and then conclude the presentation. So generational garbage collection can be thought of as a, uh, a multi-partition memory structure. So uh, the, heap in, in, the heap in the generational garbage collection is engineered uh, based off object lifetime. In general, objects live and die very quickly, and then uh, the objects that do remain uh, for a long time are expected to uh, stay in the heap for uh, a long, well, much longer periods of time. So, uh, just to break this slide down, uh, we have we have two main generations. We have the tenure generation. This is considered the permanent uh, generation. This is where objects live pretty much forever until a full garbage collection takes place. And then in the young generation, we have uh, two main uh, memory structures. We have the survival space, and then we have the eating space. The eating space is partitioned uh, for thread local allocation with thread local, local, local allocation buffers. And this is where objects are allocated by each thread uh, independently so they don't uh, cause a deadlock in the, the overall application runtime. So basically, it enables them to uh, bump, the point, bump the pointer and allocate memory as they need to uh, meet the application's demand. And then after, after uh, a garbage collection cycle, the objects are promoted into the survivor space. Survivor space uses copy collection. Uh, copy collection means that any time garbage collection happens here in the survivor space, it just copies to the next survivor space, and so on and so forth, until the object is actually promoted up into tenure space, or the tenure space. So uh, there's this distinction between unmanaged and managed uh, memory. 
So unmanaged memory works in the following way. We do an allocation for our data object, and that allocation is typically done with malloc or new using C++ or C, and then we perform some type of data mutation on the structure of this data blob. Then, once we're done with it, we choose to do some type of sanitization, and then deallocate it, or if we're not in the security mindset, we just deallocate it. Note that the memory doesn't ever change its location, so that the object will live and die in the same place, and it makes it more likely that this, this data can actually be overwritten. And there are also certain constructs within the operating system that when the, the memory is deallocated, the operating system will automatically sanitize it, and this is uh, from pre previous research. So, what does it look like for a managed runtime? And I know this, this, is not, this slide looks a little noisy, but it makes a little more sense once I start walking through it. So first of all, in our Eden space right here, and the TLAB, TLAB, we have an allocation that takes place. Let's say we're allocating a long list string or a password, for instance. So we allocate the, the object, the string, we assign the password to the string, and then all of a sudden the garbage collection takes place. When that garbage collection takes place, our, our string is moved up into the survivor space, and that latent data from the string remains in the TLAB. So this means that we have two copies, two potential copies or two potential opportunities to recover that data. So now another garbage collection takes place because a large allocation or a large allocation occurred. Now that object is copied into the tenured space, and we have this latent object that exists in the survivor space, and we also have a latent object existing in the TLAB space. So this is where our multiple copies come from. So uh, under some circumstances, and, and generally in the the Eden space and the survivor space, data can actually be overwritten. And this is kind of like the security mechanism for taking care of, of sensitive data. Um, but this is, this, this, is, this is bad for people who are security minded, but great for people who want to do forensics on it. So what exactly does an object look like in the heat? So here we have a, a, a string array of two. So we've got this first reference right here to a string, and it points to our string object. Our string object is uh, this, this first little uh, double or double word is just basically a, a header for the OOP, and then the second defines the type, so this tells us that it's a string, and then this third uh, field tells us that we're pointing to a char array, and this char array says uh, it's it's uh, length five, all right here, and then this designates that this is a char type, and then here's the, the character buffer that makes up our character or our string. So if the developer makes a creates a new string and then reassigns it to the uh, to our our string array, what happens is this reference is updated with our new string. So in this case it's moved from mesh to group, but what happens is this string is still retained in the heap, full structure and everything. And it won't be overwritten until garbage collection takes place and the, the data is reallocated to a new object. So that means we can take advantage of this and recover these artifacts to do forensics and uh, do timelining and event uh, recreation. So we, we created this framework called Regroup that uh, is it generally focused on the JVM but can be retargeted for .NET with additional research. So uh, in the first steps, we capture the memory. This is uh, basically we do a, a DD slash, or we, we dump RAM using something like Lime or uh, some other memory capture facility. And then we reconstruct the process using volatility. Reconstruction of the process just takes all the physical memory pages and re, re, resets, or re, reorganizes them into a process-oriented layout using the virtual memory addressing. And then we extract our loaded, ty loaded types from the, the internals of the JVM. We locate all the managed memory and then enumerate all the objects for uh, reconstruction and uh, timeline. So the overview of, of Recoup goes something like this. We have a overlay uh, layer that allows us to do overlays on top of the memory blobs and recover the pertinent structures for uh, reading and writing to the, well, mostly reading the, the data from the, the memory. Then we have our, uh, our type management and our, our reconstruction layer that allows us to extract out the OOPs and then reconstruct the, the Java objects into a, a Python object. And then we have an interface that we could repurpose for another, another uh, managed runtime. So in this case, we're actually only focusing on x86, 32-bit uh, uh, for Windows and Linux. Uh, this would probably work on Mac, just with a little bit of rejiggering for the, the overlays, but for the most part, it's, it's generalizable, uh, such as volatility is with the, the overlays. So the first step in our process, the first real step in our process is extracting out the, the types from the, the, the system dictionary. 
Um, all managed runtimes have some way of doing advanced reflection or understanding the types they're loading and, and executing against. Um, and the JVM, this is the system dictionary. This maintains all the, the classes that are loaded, like string, class, socket, uh, things of, of that nature. And then we have the symbol table, and the symbol table includes all the strings for all the, the different methods, fields, and classes that we'll, we would encounter. And then the string table is where we find all the constants and, and along the objects. So our approach is extract this, mine the structures for the, or mine the information we find here for the loaded data structures, and then move forward to reconstruct everything. So to, to identify all of these, these structures, what we do is we scan the uh, process memory for the JVM. We look for invariant fields that we would typically find in the system dictionary, symbol table, and string table. We attempt to parse the, the structure as one of those elements, or one of those data structures. And then if uh, we get back same results, then we, we, move to, uh, we move on to the next step. Uh, we also use some uh, we use a number of constraints to keep the uh, parsing from going out of control. So, for instance, if we read memory and it's uh, let's say it the first value looks correct, but the next value is, is just something out, outlandish, it tells us that we need to read 2,000 elements or 3,000 elements. We we would consider that out of bounds, and we would <coughs> stop with that uh, parsing and move on to the next candidate. So once we've identified all of our different types, once we've identified all of our symbols, the next step is identifying where the managed memory is within the, the JVM heap. Um, the JVM heap, um, well, the JVM itself manages its own memory with its own memory system. So there's not just this, this managed memory segment. There's also a segment for the, the JIT, and there's also, uh, there's also elements for the, the uh, underlying uh, resource structures and the actual JVM itself. So uh, our goal is to actually find that, that place of memory where the uh, element or the data objects for the JVM actually exist. And to do this, um, there's two approaches that can be taken. Uh, the easiest approach that we, we use is uh, scanning the, the JVM heap for logs. And these logs are produced every time a garbage collection takes place, and they tell us exactly where the different uh, spaces are. So the Eden space, which tells which is where all the, the uh, short lived objects exist, would exist in 08400 or 08XAA48. 48,000, whatever, up to uh, 256 uh, bytes, or 256 megabytes of, of data, or uh, of size. And the front space, uh, similarly, and then the, 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 the permanent space. And we use this information to actually identify the segments of the, the managed memory. But then we can also use the type information that we recovered from the system dictionary. What's interesting about Java, and if you remember from that previous uh, slide where I talked about the, the memory layout, Every object has a, a pointer telling a pointer into the system to, or a pointer to the type that it's actually implementing, and this can give us a, a lot of information as far as okay whether or not this is a, this is an OP or this is this is just some random bit of data, and so what we can do is we can scan this these managed memory segments for high distributions of, of type pointers and then also look for an, a, a wide or a range of, of of unique pointers, and this gives us a good layout especially for the Eden space and for the, the, uh, the tenure space. The reason why the survivor space has such a, an awful distribution is, is mainly because it's just a, a copy collection. It's just kind of like this intermediate space where stuff gets spread out across uh, over each uh, garbage collection. So once we've identified our managed memory, the next step is to scan for the uh, managed objects and recover them. When we're scanning for the managed objects, what we typically do is look for that type pointer within the, the or type pointer pointing to the, the type class, and then we parse uh, the next few bytes and the last the word before it to figure out whether or not this is a valid object and this is something we can recover data from. And note, since we have the type pointer for which we want to uh, extract the object from, we can also look at the different fields for the for the Java class. So we're looking at the uh, we're not looking at just the type pointer, but we're also looking at does this type pointer that says this is type pointer such as a string, which has a, a character buffer, does that next object have a character buffer, and does that character buffer uh, uh, line up with what we would expect as a valid value for the, the buffer size? So in general, when we're looking for uh, artifacts using this approach, we focus on looking for Java threads, sockets, and uh, mostly files that we wouldn't be able to recover off of disk. So our general approach to, in, in this regard is 
uh, let's say that the attacker has managed to upload their code and then delete it from disk. So how do we actually recover the Java uh, malware that was executing uh, that we can't recover from, from the disk itself? And so this allows us to do some, do some uh, more detailed analysis against those, I guess, fileless malware attacks. So in the case of jar entries and jar files, we can actually recover these by looking for the objects or the objects and types that implement the, the jar, jar entries and the jar files. And when we start talking about looking at sockets, we can also start looking at uh, buffer data that was that could be recovered from the uh, from the, the various buffers that implement the, the, the socket itself. And then we can also recover information for, uh, related to processes. So for our evaluation of uh, of our framework, we couldn't just use an off-the-shelf malware like admin or uh, another uh, Java backdoor. Uh, we we actually wrote uh, an implant that mimics what we would, the type of behavior we would see with a, a Java malware. And then we, uh, we ran that a couple, with, against a threat actor script that we, we think we would see. So basically, mimicking somebody who gains access to a system, running through, trying to figure out what access does that particular attacker have within the, the local network. Uh, can they proxy traffic, proxy traffic in and out? Can they do things like uh, file manipulation? And can they uh, create run operating system commands? And so the next step beyond that, uh, to check our progress throughout the, the script, we actually take memory snapshots to ensure that, uh, first of all, to capture uh, the information that we think we can have, or capture the information that's produced, <coughs> and determine whether or not we can actually map that to back to our script. So uh, as I mentioned before, we, we just focus on five key elements found in a, a, a malware sample. We want to load code. Uh, load Java shellcode from over the network. Uh, <coughs> Java shellcode in this case would be bytecode, so we're transferring a, a live Java class over the network, loading it and executing it, exfiltrating data, executing operating system commands, modifying files, and then also trying to proxy traffic within the local network. So in our first experiment, we just wanted to see uh, what information we could recover and how it compared against other tools. So with volatility, uh, one of the, the core problems with using this in a, a JVM context is you will lose a lot of artifacts over time because the operating system will reallocate memory that's been deallocated for uh, 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 after the process dies, for instance. But in this case, when our, when our JVM uh, keeps running, the socket, socket data is retained, and it also keeps it in an ordered fashion in the heap, so we can actually assign uh, time values to figure out how long it, uh, or figure out what order uh, things took place in. So in this case, we have a proxy uh, traffic, and we're actually able to recover the, soft, the buffered socket data from the attacker, and then the, the inside, uh, inside compromise host and the outside attacker. And this allows us to uh, get more context from what has happened uh, in general. So another uh, thing we wanted to look at is what if, if the JVM is used to execute operating system processes, what information can we gather from that? So uh, the general approach to starting a process in, in the JVM is looking at uh, the process builder class. The process builder takes a series, a stream command, and translates that into a uh, fork command on Linux, and then executes that uh, within the environment. So at times, you might be able to recover the, the strings behind the process builder, but it's not likely. But what's, what we can recover is the PID for the process that we were looking at, and uh, latent data within the, the, the buffer itself. So in this case, our attacker executed uh, cat, etsy, password, uh, uname, uh, group, and then uh, also catted the, the shadow file, and, oh, that's suitors, catted the shadow file, catted the uh, password file, ran inmap, uh, ran history and grep for what the history, or grep for anything that was taking place, did IF config, uh, and then uh, another, uh, set of commands. So this kind of gives us uh, some context around what has happened and what the attacker did when they were on the box. But it also gives us the PID for, for which these, these processes uh, executed. So we went back and actually tried to see, or we went back and used volatility to see if we could recover the process information. And we found that volatility actually would not uh, list these, these particular processes. Um, and so this kind of gives us an additional leg up or an additional tool in our, our forensics toolbox to, to help us with that analysis. Uh, another thing we look at is, uh, generally when we're analyzing malware, 
uh, the malware itself is obfuscated to the point where it has a number of, of random functions that don't do anything. Uh, a lot of times those functions aren't ever called. So we can actually exploit information from within the JVM, such as method calls, uh, method calls and uh, other elements along that lines to determine, or sorry, method call counters to determine whether or not a method was called. And we can also look at how many times it was called. So for instance, for main and start, it was executed one time. So we know that this is kind of a relevant function because it was used once, but we don't know how relevant it is, but we can go back and look at uh, the code that we recovered from memory later. Another thing we can look at is sit data or look at how many times it was called. So if these were called pretty a pretty significant amount or pretty uh, pretty significant number of times, so these might actually be important. So this would help us uh, determine what we should be analyzing and what we should look at when we start moving forward with reverse engineering uh, the the bytecode that we recover from from memory. So the one last uh, point that I want to uh, make about our research is. Uh, the longevity of objects created, or the longevity of process objects created in Java. So this kind of went, ran counter to our intuition. We knew that with garbage collection, uh, we would see a fall off of objects, but with the actual process objects, they were retained through the entire process, or through our entire experiment. Um, the other thing that was pretty fairly interesting is the output buffer of our, our processes. If you notice, uh, it, it kind of goes up and then it maintains constant. constant. Uh, and this runs counter to what happens when a garbage collection takes place in these, at these two points. Um, so this is where the garbage collection takes place. And we know this because uh, the process builder, the commands that we were recovering, were wiped out and we couldn't recover them after this point uh, for, for experiments uh, T25 and less. Uh, however, we could still recover uh, data buffers from, uh, experiment, or from commands that were executed from around T20 and, and onward. So, uh, what I've shown with our research is that memory analysis at higher levels in the managed runtime can help us understand what threat actors do when they are actually using managed runtime tools, um, which is uh, kind of that step up, moving up the stack uh, above volatility. We've shown that uh, given the memory allocation uh, strategy of garbage, collect garbage collectors, the uh, timelining effort is actually much easier than it would be when you're looking at raw native objects. And then finally, I show, I've kind of given, an, uh, kind of given a, a generalized method for analyzing future garbage collected uh, managed runtimes because uh, with .NET and JavaScript, or Google V8 JavaScript, they have similar types of garbage collectors, and these uh, these properties can actually be leveraged to perform in investigations again, investigations or malware analysis against these particular runtimes. And with that, I'll open it up with questions. Thanks. Yes. Basically, what I see here is the garbage collection is the one which is going, which is a problem, and also the operating system allocates memory for something else. So, can we introduce a bytecode where we don't let the program take execute complete before the garbage collection? We can just abnormally terminate the program where all the objects are loaded, and we can just take the memory down, and it's much easier to analyze. Uh, Have you thought about this? I, I haven't thought about that, but yeah, it's it's within the realm of possibility. So one of my some of my previous research focused on measuring the uh, <coughs> extension of TLS keys inside the JVM key, and in order to do that, I had to uh, modify I modified the JVM to uh, actually get rid of the, the data within the within the heap um, or overwrite the, same, the sensitive data. So it's within the realm of possibility that someone could actually introduce a bytecode or introduce uh, some additional functionality and yeah. <laughs> so then it can be much easier. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? From the back, maybe? Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to ask you one question. Um, when you recover objects from, uh, from the heap, uh, clearly some of them could be partially overridden. Mm -hmm. So how does recoup recover or how does it deal with objects which are not complete or, say, references of which may not be there? So uh, in order to deal with references that are not there, uh, we just we simply ignore them. Because uh, the, the pointer valid isn't the same once we try to attempt to parse it. Uh, for objects that are partially overwritten, so like character buffer, um, there, there isn't a lot we can do. I mean, the only thing we can do is interpret the, the character buffer in the string as it is and then leave it up to the 
analyst to, to determine whether or not it's a valid string. Uh, so case in point, uh, we can do a, a logic check. So strings aren't supposed to exceed 65, 535 characters or, or so. Uh, so we can look at those buffers, and if they exceed uh, that that length, then we can say this this is this is not a valid uh, character, um, or this is not a, this is not a valid object. And you know we can point that out, but we don't do anything to that that level of analysis. We kind of leave it up to the person doing the investigation. Okay, but there is a possibility in recoup produce all of these partially damaged objects. Yes, and they're not totally lost. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's and that's kind of the risk that we run. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank Again, thank you.